This is a lecture by L. Ron Hubbard given on the 27th of April, 1955. The title of this lecture is Gray Dianetics. This lecture is 64 minutes long. Reproduced by Golden Era Productions. I am very happy to see you folks here this evening. If I were as much as in present time as you were, I'd be very happy indeed. As a matter of fact, uh, we work awfully hard around the HASI and the Foundation, and the weeks creep up and sneak up on you, and uh, all of a sudden it's Wednesday night again. Wednesday night and nothing to talk about, and so I just have to stand up here and fill in time for you. I wish I had some vital thing I could tell you this evening. There have only been 30 or 40 world-shaking developments in the last fortnight in the HASI, but uh, I try to keep these lectures non-technical. And uh, there have been uh, quite a few interesting occurrences here and there throughout the world, in the world of Scientology, which is the world after all. <laughs> and. Uh, I'd like to tell you about these, but we have enough time. And so, actually, it's very, very difficult to really know what to talk to you about that would actually interest you. There's hardly anything that you could be told that you don't know already, so I'm going to talk to you about gray Dianetics. <laughs> now, uh, Dianetics is a coined word meaning through mind, and it was really released in 1948. Uh, quite successful, actually, a psychotherapy. Now, there's white Dianetics and there's black Dianetics. Black Dianetics was never practiced, uh, from my point of view, occasionally, unintentionally practiced by some auditor. Or another, who probably doesn't have a certificate now. The first material on Dianetics became known to intimates of mine at the Explorers Club in New York City in 1938. It was a very cosmopolitan club. The people who belonged to it are simply explorers. To be a regular member of the club, it's necessary to have led an expedition into the wilds and unknown places of Earth. And one expects his friends merely to be interested in this particular sphere, and one, because the Explorers Club does get around, uh, one does not expect anyone's politics to cross one up was very amusing that the Explorers Club was chosen as an institution of learning by the U.S. government, who didn't know where the North and South Poles were exactly, and had lost several islands and maps thereunto that the Japanese now had, the only place they could get in geographical information from the Explorers Club, so they made it a, an institution of learning. It was a very odd thing that while the Explorers Club was very busy serving the United States government, to the best of its ability, that it was carrying on its roles a great many officers of the German Reich as not yet being suspended because of non-payment of dues, because of probable non-delivery of mail. And that was the way their membership cards read. You see, there are a great many famous German explorers, too. And there are a great many famous Japanese explorers, too. And anti-submarine warfare would have been nowhere if it were not for a couple of Japanese explorers and scientists who sounded the velocities of sound in various parts of the globe. They went out and sounded the oceans. And so these people, Japanese officers, furiously embroiled with the United States government were sitting there in New York City at 10 West 72nd Street, quietly in the files, 
as uh, bona fide members of the Explorers Club, but nobody knew any reason to have any restriction about them at all. And I asked the secretary one day, I said, I said, uh, what about uh, the Russian and uh, German and Japanese and some of our old pals? I mean, I don't see them around here. And then I caught myself and realized that the war, <laughs> the war had started. Very cosmopolitan organization. You kind of step out of nationalism when you step into exploration. Uh, it would be a happy thing, by the way, if more of the world felt like that. The fact of the matter is, uh, several such members are still carried on the rolls of the Explorers Club because no one is content that they are dead. They are simply missing in action. German officers, uh, Austrian officers, Japanese officers who are merely missing in action and whose uh, complete demise has not been established. So the Explorers Club is still not suspending them for non-payment of dues yet. Another 10, 12 years, they probably say, well, <laughs> that guy's never going to pay his dues and uh, cancel him off. The uh, oddity is that uh, the Explorers Club, more than any embassy or legation, forms a crossroads for the uh, governments of the world. Practically any explorer has had something to do with government. He's turned in his reports to government and back and forth, and very many people in government are members of it. And this was no exception when it came to AMTORG, which was in the United States uh, at that time. as the uh, American-Russian trading organization. And uh, this group was all the council or minister abroad or ambassador that Russia had in the United States. And these men, of course, were quite ordinarily found up at the Explorers Club at tea time, you know. How are you? And you should have been with me that time when that bear up on the steps and when we caught him, he was that long and, you know, this sort of thing going on, chit-chatty in that fashion. These boys got heard that I was working in the field of the human mind. This is very peculiar, somebody who was an explorer working in the field of the mind. They didn't know I was a physicist uh, right away. But uh, a few days later, one of these fellows got real interested in me. His name was Commissar Galinsky, a very fascinating fellow. Uh, very personable. You have to be personable. It takes quite a personality to keep from getting liquidated in Russia. <laughs> and uh, Commissar Galinsky uh, sidled up to me and he said, uh, uh, I'd like you to come over to dinner tomorrow night. And uh, I said, well, okay, sure. Just soon the borscht would be on you. <laughs> Went over to dinner and he said, I understand you've been working in the field of the mind a little bit. I understand you're a physicist, been working in the field of the mind. Uh, I said, that's right. And he says, now, uh, he said, uh, your uh, material probably could be of some interest to the Russian government. And uh, I said, well, it probably could be. And we went on eating our borscht and vodka and so forth and talking about bears. And he kept interjecting this once in a while. I went home, and the only existing manuscript I had written on the subject was gone. Well, I never kept anything in a safe. I was just a writer place to keep things if you're a writer is in magazines, in books, on the screen. You don't ever have a say. Manuscript was just lying there. Well, I don't know just what coincidence could have occurred here that I would be invited, my whereabouts would be known, and the manuscript would be missing. Of course, I'm being suspicious. That's my paranoia coming out. So, anyway, a uh, few days went on, and uh, Commissar Glinsky saw me at the club again. I was being Toastmaster, sitting there shutting out tea to somebody from the Belgian Congo and somebody who had just come in from Finland and so forth. And they, honest, they drink tea and eat cinnamon toast. <laughs> the Explorers Club is fantastic. Uh, very soberly, too, just as, though, just as though this were an important occasion. Uh, they also, at their dinners, serve 250,000-year-old uh, mammoth. You know, it's been in the ice up in the tundra for 250,000 years, and they serve steaks and so forth. And salad is the stuff out of the mammoth's stomach. Some of the explorers actually eat it, too. 
But uh, anyway, he, he was sitting there and he said, well, he said, hey, are you so busy that you couldn't take a little time off? I said, well, I don't know. Uh, to do what? He says, to go to Russia. You must remember, this was still in the heyday when they were hiring lots of American engineers in Russia. They were building dams and digging clams over there. They were having a fine time. So uh, he said, are you sure that you wouldn't like to go over to Russia? He said, I could have you in an audience with Stalin within 10 days. We can have a plane, Russia, you could be back here in two weeks. And I said, why? He said, your work on estimating the amount of work that a person should be able to do would be very important to the Russians. Then we would know whether somebody was loafing or not. I didn't bother. I was too polite to ask him where he had gotten this data because he would have said page 32 of your manuscript. <laughs> So I said no, and he finally said, well, if you'd come over, he said, we'd give you a nice laboratory, and we'd give you good pay, and uh, everybody would leave you alone. I can imagine it now. Everybody would leave you alone. You said it, you know. <laughs> Iron bars all around. <laughs> and uh, we said no. He said, well, you know, if you have any information on this subject in written form, we would be very interested. And I imagine they have been, since they have taken it all, one way or the other, as fast as it has been released by myself at the Foundation. It has very often arrived in Russia before it's arrived in New York. Such zeal. I would have sent it to Stalin, too, in the hopes he'd read it sometime or another. Unfortunately, he never got a chance to really get down and study. I mean, he got a stroke. Uh, before he had a chance to blow up the war to end all wars, as all wars do. Now, uh, we're in a terrific hysteria, nationally, I understand, about brainwashing. It was a tremendous big uh, conference they had the other day. They had everybody who was anybody in there in Washington. They went on for several days. Uh, they neglected to call anybody in who knew anything about the mind, but uh, they were, did have a conference. They called in the AEC and the PDQ and, and Eisenhower's butler, all the authorities. They called all them in. And they were worried about brainwashing for our boys. Evidently, the Russians have been doing something to people's minds. Did you hear about this? They've evidently been doing something to people's minds. Well, I don't know why they call it brainwashing unless somebody has the idea that people have dirty minds. <laughs> but it seems like the Russian brainwashing is not desired by the U.S. general staff. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff have a feeling that this shouldn't happen. And said publicly they wanted to do something about it. And they were very anxious to do something about it. Well, the Russians aren't using Dianetics. I can tell you that right now. Because there hasn't been a revolution yet. I'll tell you that very clearly. Uh, the Communist Party here is very, very inefficient. Just like last war, I, last war but one, World War II. I finally found out why we won that war. Is our general staff was not quite as stupid as the Japanese general staff. And so we won the war. Now, uh, this was a rather obvious fact. But the Russian method of washing brains from a critical, st I don't mean to criticize you, understand? It was sloppy. <laughs> and in Dianetics, as such, we can do a great deal to wipe out 
the effects of brain washings because no brains can really be washed. In other words, Dianetics will undo Russian brainwashing. But much more important than this, brainwashing goes on every day in these United States, leaving a very baffled police. And this is something that's of interest to us. I, I dare say it's very horrible to have quite a few men in your company captured and come back raving all out for communism. Actually, we don't even know whether or not any process was used on them. Maybe they simply liked communism better, you know? This might have occurred. That could occur. Let's take some boy, maybe he raised down the South, never had a chance, never had a piece of land, discriminated against, thrown into juvenile delinquency jails time after time, and all of a sudden, for the first time in his life, somebody says, you're valuable, we want you. Well, you say, well, this is an American boy, he should have a reaction to stand up for America. Well, maybe America didn't stand up for this boy. And so he says, uh, communism, three cheers. And he comes back and says, to hell with you guys, I'm a communist now. That wouldn't be unreasonable. Work both ways. We have a lot of people that go communistic, and they have a lot of people that go democratistic, or whatever ideology this is, Eisenhowerism. We have a lot of boys that uh, in Russia that rush across the border, you know. Things work both ways. Human beings are human beings. They change their minds. But uh, this isn't an important thing. So there are a few hundred people that have had their brains washed, a la Russian. There are thousands and thousands and thousands that have been very painfully shot and wounded, and there have been thousands more that have been killed. And there's been this little handful that's been brainwashed, so we have the AEC and the, the PDQ and the, the I Will Arise cabinet minister, and <laughs> all having big conferences about this terribly important thing. How would you take somebody and change his allegiance and loyalties? Well, you could do it by implantation. Now, we know that hypnotism occasionally and once in a million years works on somebody. Now, how would you make hypnotism effective? Well, I'll tell you how you could with greatest of ease. You don't sit somebody in a chair to hypnotize him and say, abracadabra, woo-woo, uh, you will now believe you're a goat. It's not hypnotism. Anyhow, that's a Western version, sort of a comedy act. Uh, Indian hypnotism is much more effective than that. You, know, you don't even go with your hand, it's tough. But hypnotic trance is very easy to induce. But not everybody can have a hypnotic trance induced, so all we'd have to do is get a little bit more violent about it. And we would take this fellow, and we wouldn't sit him in the chair. We'd pick him up by the throat, we'd hit him in the jaw, we would kick him in the groin, and we would throttle him good and proper, and we would shoot him in the arm with some sodium pentothal, and give him a good kick in the kidneys, and say, you're a dog. And then stamp on his head, knock out his teeth, maybe, and say, you're a dog. I'll guarantee you, at some future date in his life, this fellow's going to start barking. Now, that is an implantation. Crude, raw. A fellow who has been hurt many times by one object will eventually become obsessed with this object. The more automobile accidents you have in America, the more obsession there will be with motor vehicles. Because they hurt people. That means they're authoritative. They're bosses of things. Furthermore, they move people around in time and space. You know that you could take a man on an operating table. He's lying there. He's in pain. Only one word spoken to him. This man isn't going to live. He's going to die. The fellow never comes out of it. Simple. There's always something there recording. There's always something there to take it down. And when there's a great scarcity of communication, that little bit of communication is picked up by the individual and used just as a hypnotic suggestion would be used. Now what I'm talking to you about is not controversial. This is known since the days of Anton Mesmer. Only today we could be far more efficient about it. We could not just change somebody's political loyalties. We could change his name and everything else. We could induce total amnesia if we had to. Just by this process of beating him and telling him. 
Now, this is not much different than what a little gang of boys do. They start fighting each other uh, one way or the other, and finally they, one kid seems to win, and he tells the rest of them what to do. And that's the way a gang operates. A little gang of boys, and they fight and fight, and finally there's this guy, and he can lick all the rest of them. So now when he says, we are now going to play rabbit, everybody plays rabbit. What is that but a sort of hypnotism? But it's induced usually amongst little boys by pain. You could do the same thing. If you were to take an insane patient and beat them around enough, you might or might not get a registry. That's what they usually experiment with, with pain drug hypnosis, PDH. Pain drug hypnosis, usually what they experiment with. Uh, insane people. Let me call to your attention that these people cannot express what they think. These people have no coordination. They cannot demonstrate what they think. They cannot speak what they think. So therefore, they're not a worthy subject either for hypnotism or for PDH. If a person's insane, he's already had too much. It's really what insanity is. So here's this individual, perfectly sane. And now we take 10 minutes out of his life that he can't account for. He knows something happened in those 10 minutes, but he can't account for them. You know what will happen? Any verbal content of those 10 minutes, if driven home by pain, will be authoritative on him and will dictate to him and tell him what he can do. That's an oddity. That's a mechanical oddity, a phenomenon, if you please. But it is a true one. We take a sane man. He's got 10 minutes of his life that he can't account for. Well, an operation to some degree has this effect, but the fellow can account for that. He sometimes can't account for everything that went on during the operation, but he can account for some of it, and he knows he was in the operating room for those 10 minutes. Supposing this fellow had this happen to him. He drives into his garage, and then he wakes up in bed, but he never walked into the house, and he knows it. He looks himself over. He can't find any bruises. He'll start to think, what the devil did happen? Let's see, I drove into the garage. You see, he may not know that he's forgotten this for some days, but I drove into the garage. I never walked into the house. What happened? I woke up. I didn't feel well. Now, what happened after I drove into the garage? He wasn't expecting a dental extraction. He was not expecting to have his tonsils removed or his appendix sliced out or other geographical activities on the part of medicine. <laughs> he wasn't expecting very many things uh, to occur. All he was expecting to do was turn off his ignition Go in the house. Now, maybe what calls it to his attention, he goes back out the next morning. He just knows he feels bad. And he gets in the car and he starts to reach into his pockets where he always keeps his car keys. And he says, where are they? They're in the ignition. He knows he's never done that. He'd never leave the keys in. But he says, well, I might have. I might have, you know. And he couldn't find his hat that morning either. He, comes, he doesn't worry anymore about this. Maybe he comes home at night and he happens to look into the back of the car where he's laid the groceries and there's his hat, crushed in. What's his hat doing there? Why were the keys there? There's minutes gone out of this man's life. He's trying to account for them. There's an accounting for them there. You are now to follow all of the orders of. Yes, that's the content in that missing time. He unfortunately will get that without knowing he's getting it. He will have bad. Fantastic. PDH. The question is, could you take an individual, a perfectly sane individual, and take him in such a way, let's say he walks into his office, and at noon, his secretary comes in 
and he's lying sprawled down across his desk with the ink bottle upset. And she wakes him up and says, what's the matter? And he doesn't know. He has no idea what's the matter. How did he get this way? Who was in his office? He tries to remember this. He can't. Who was in his office? Who was sitting there waiting for him when he came in? There is a fire escape. The window is open to the fire escape. Nobody passed in and out past the secretary. Oh, he'll find out, but he finds out the wrong thing. He finds out what was said to him while he was being slugged. And one of the things said to him was, forget it, and you will forget everything you know about us. But you will remember to obey these words. Sounds fantastic, doesn't it? That's how you make a slave society. That's what uh, George Orwell was writing about in 1984, his famous novel. It's that sort of thing which brings about a slave condition. The unknown hanging over people. Unknown accidents or incidents, unknown occurrences, something did happen, they should know, they don't know, and they are suddenly driven by hidden impulses they cannot explain. And you can produce this as easily, much more easily, than the Russians can wash a brain. It's a very funny thing, several things that happened in this field. Now, let's take the uh, criminal. Is the criminal ever PDH'd? Does PDH have anything to do with the amount of criminality extant in these United States? Does it? They take a light and they shine it into the criminal's eyes. That's one of the ways you hypnotize somebody. They bang him around. They sometimes give him a chair that rocks sideways. They leave him without water and they tell him, hour after hour after hour, you did this crime. You did this crime. Now come on, tell us where you hid the body. Maybe the fellow's perfectly innocent. It doesn't matter. Somewhere along the line, he's going to lose sight. They'll keep at it for 24, 36 hours. What is this but PDH? Nothing else. Very often, the criminal then takes a piece of paper, pencil, and he writes a full confession. What's he writing? He's writing what he was told while this light was shining on his face. And why, then, no confession of murder is acceptable. Courts have found this happen so often that now a confession to having murdered somebody is not acceptable in the court. Did you know that? You could go ahead and confess you'd murdered somebody. The court doesn't believe you half the time. Because too many people come in and say, I've murdered somebody. And there's too many people who believe that they have committed murders. And they come in and confess them. And they can't tell you the circumstances about it. Well, that's a PDH of kind, isn't it? Hmm? That's PDH. We take a fellow. We put him under a bright light. And we say to him for 24 hours, you are a criminal. Society doesn't want you. You are guilty of such and such a crime. And the fellow says, no, I'm not guilty. He resists, resists, resists. And he goes out of there. And he says, what do you know? He says, I'm a criminal. That's PDH. Now, intentionally or otherwise, psychiatry aids and abets this. They take somebody who's mild and erotic, and they give him some sodium pentothal. And they say to him, you will now remember the horrible sexual incident, slurp, slurp, <laughs> will put you in this condition, unreasonably assuming that it was a sexual incident, which I can guarantee you 100% of the time it never was. It's not true that sexual incidents make people insane. I only wish it were. <laughs> business of making people well would be so titillating. <laughs> now, the uh, boy with the sodium pentothal using a process during the last war and forward till now called uh, narcosynthesis. Straight PDH. I mean, you put a man to sleep, and then you tell him he can remember all about it and tell him he is now, this is a direct quote from narcosynthetic procedure. He's asleep, but he's talking. You can make anybody like this. You can put anybody into this condition. And you say, you are now reliving the experience of having gotten wounded. 
And he comes out of that, quote, treatment, unquote, and he is now reliving the experience of the battlefield. He is now nervous and now insane, whether he was before or not. Now, I'm not condemning modern psychiatry. I'm shooting them from guns. There's a difference, you know. This was narcosynthesis, and this was general practice that was used on World War II veterans. I know we've cleaned up too many of them. Narcosynthesis. But that's PDH, just like that. You put a guy to sleep, and then you talk at him, you know, and you tell him things. And he tries to remember what happened in this incident, and all he gets is the compulsive obedience of the operator's voice. You got it? Now, there's a much milder form of PDH that you would recognize much more clearly than these violent things. <laughs> You're a mama sitting in a rocking chair with you in her arms, rocking. She's rocking back and forth. And there you are. She says, go to sleep, little baby. Everything will be all right. Yeah, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Baby feels perfectly secure. But it does get kind of glassy-eyed where mama's concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, in an unguarded moment, mama says to him, not go to sleep, little baby, but you little blankety blank you're a rowdy. You're no good. And the kid walks around saying, what do you know? I'm no good. <laughs> That's the way it goes. I mean, aberration is as simple as that. Think how much worse it is if it's by violence. All right. That's a much gentler form, but it's kind of along the same line. That's nailed in as much by affection as anything else. There's no affection in PDH, really. Well, let's look at the possible effect in another field. Dentistry. Dennis got you there in the chair, local anesthetic, you know, and he's got, you know, a buzzer, you know, drill, and he goes in, gets me in your stomach, you know, <laughs> gets you in there real good. <laughs> well, if he's keeping his if he's worth his salt, why, he just goes ahead and does his job. But usually he doesn't do that. Yap, 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 yap. Fantastic, but true. Somebody, one of the staff auditors, the other day walked in and he was seething. His wife had just been to the dentist. Dentist, uh, technician was there, and she started cleaning her teeth, you know, in the hard way, getting all messed up, and, you know, and talking at her all the time about how horrible food was, and how horrible birth was, and how horrible a lot of other things were, and this wife's pregnant. The girl's nailed down in the chair, having her teeth all messed up, while somebody's telling her how horrible it all is, and of course the girl get out of the chair just like she did, and she doesn't know whether she's walking up or walking down. Husband was an auditor. This girl was lucky. See? Lucky. She'd have gotten out of there with the silliest idea that if you, you know, you give birth to a child, you die and all your teeth fall out or something like that. Her auditor husband took a look at her and says, What happened to you? And she says, Well, I don't know. I had a dental. <laughs> Auditor was slightly late for his appointment because he took her and backed her up against the wall and says, all right, now let's spot the place where this happened. And out it came. And that was that, nullified it. Because Scientology nullifies, rather easily handles, erases the effects of this sort of thing. Not too hard to do in Scientology, but it takes a Scientologist and the knowledge of Scientology. I get that little point there. It takes a Scientologist and the knowledge of it. Mustn't overlook those facts. There aren't very many Scientologists. There are probably many more Scientologists today than there are psychiatrists by a long ways. But uh, there's not very many. And uh, you've you got these PDHs going in faster than anybody could ever get them out. How it is. Reading the paper the other day, a little girl had a mysterious and sudden onset 
immediately after tonsillectomy, which was diagnosed as encephalitis, which nobody has ever diagnosed yet. She'd all of a sudden frozen stiff after the operation, and she was still lying there weeks later. Stiff. What was she doing? Why is this little nine-year-old girl lying in a hospital totally stiff? Why is this girl in a postpartum psychosis over here? Why is she still screaming? She delivered her baby a week before. All right, let's get a little bit more factual than that. We go down the ward a little bit further. There was another woman down there, and she was still hemorrhaging. She delivered her baby 15 days before. Why is she still hemorrhaging? That's because some damn dumb doctor didn't know enough to keep his yak shut during the delivery. And that's the total fact anybody needs to know. Now, that sounds awfully simple, doesn't it? Sounds awful simple, but it's just too much for anybody to grasp, I guess. When somebody's in pain and under duress, the thing to do is either talk so much that you talk them completely out of the condition, but that would take a lot of talk, believe me, and a lot more affinity than anybody could possibly minister up in a hospital. Or the better solution, Keep your mouth shut. Say nothing. Well, the girl who was screaming got her in present time, got her to touch the bed, you know, and feel around and square things around her skin in present time. She stopped screaming. It was back in the days of Dianetics. There was nothing much to it. I merely tried to get her attention, got her at present time one way or the other, any old way I could think of, and it was real crude, but... Didn't. And then, I don't know whether stupidly or not, in those days, I audited the incident, of course, and audited the doubt of delivery. And she had some chump of an intern standing there, and the nurse, and she try, was trying to rise up so that she could get her bread or press down, and they kept saying, lie still, stay there, lie still, stay there. So she obeyed him. <laughs> She'd been there for a week. You see this? Been there for a week. The other lady hemorrhaging, more or less the same thing. Just too much yap, too much duress. That's PDH. That is the single most important source to this day of aberration. If the little rule of silent while somebody's unconscious had been obeyed rather uniformly by simply medical practitioners, dentists, think people like this, just that, the insane population of America would be at least 50% less. Just as easy as that. If they'd just known about this and kept their mouths shut when they had people under duress, pain, unconscious, just didn't talk around them why they wouldn't have these tremendous kickbacks. Now, looks to me like that's a more interesting thing to the United States public than the Russian brainwashing some 25 Marines. Marine Corps can take it. They're tough men. If they want to join the commies, the Marines never did, it was the Army. They used to be a Marine. Uh, if some of the Army draftees got the idea that being drafted and taken away from any future here in America and being sent off to some unpopular war against their will, if they got the idea that this did not recommend to them wholeheartedly democracy and if they espoused communism, I even think it's looking at these poor kids being conscripted by a bunch of old bats that couldn't pack a rifle if you beat them. I, I, I could understand this perfectly clearly, how somebody comes along and says, you don't want to be in that army anymore. And the guy said, no, I sure don't. <laughs> I never asked to come to this party in the first place. Slight difference here, you know. It's not that people should or shouldn't change their allegiance, but you can understand some soldier doing this. You can understand the Russians beating one around 
until the fellow says, I'm a communist, you know? I am a free man. I am a communist. <laughs> you can understand that. But damned if you could understand the police continuing the criminality of all of their criminals by third-degree methods which implant the idea of criminality into the heads of terrified and exhausted men. Now, that's, that, that would seem to be an awfully unprofitable procedure, wouldn't it? Let's make everybody who was arrested for a crime, guilty or not, let's make him complete with an impulse to do crime. It's an interesting thing to do. <laughs> I don't know, it looked to me like you'd increase the criminal population. And I don't think there's any financial, I suppose they could, if they knew about this, operate on the theory that the more criminals, the more police you'd have to have. So that means a job for Benny, my nephew. I suppose you could figure it that way, but I couldn't conceive of a human being thinking like that. He wouldn't be a human then, he'd be a monkey or something. All right. Now, I certainly couldn't conceive of the medical and dental profession working actively to put cash into the pockets of psychiatrists. They don't like psychiatrists. You mention psychiatry to the AMA and they get eh, fingernails on the blackboard sort of look. <laughs> and yet the exodonist is in there hammering and pounding away and yap, 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 you know. <laughs> Patient gets up out of the operation Everybody says, well, you're all right, dental operation, that doesn't hurt anybody. The fellow goes away and he tries to tell somebody, I have the funniest feeling, you know. I, I believe that, do I have a beard? <laughs> I, I feel like a goat or something. <laughs> oh, you shouldn't talk that way. I mean, everybody gets hallucinations. It's the gas that does it. <laughs> the fellow that was having the teeth extracted, kept being referred to by the nurse as this old goat. It's <laughs> the way it works. You know, I, I died down on all this completely. I mean, I, I kind of laid this aside and left it in the middle of Dianetics, Modern Science, and Mental Health, and said, well, we've got such efficient methods today to undo this stuff, and here's the know-how, and we can handle this so easily that really there isn't much use saying anything about it. And I've wakened up to the fact recently through a few guys I've audited that the practice is still going along. That writing a book and letting some people who could read read it didn't stop people who couldn't read <laughs> from going on with these practices, you see? Oh, it shouldn't be a little bit better known. Yes, we can take one of these incidents apart today in Scientology, take it apart as easy as you take apart a pot of dried beans. I mean, just <laughs> gone. But that isn't any reason why they aren't dangerous, because let me call to your attention that a large section of the populace is not under Scientology processing. Now, PEDH is also done willingly, willfully, and energetically for the exact purposes of crime and duress in this country, just as such. Big criminal syndicate wants to shut a man up. They take him out and they beat hell out of him. Telling him, meanwhile, keep his trap closed. Sure. We, we don't care how many criminals get beat up. It's nothing to us. Well, that's a good, happy way to look at it. But remember that that criminal syndicate can just as easily take a good, reputable citizen and take him out in the sticks and beat him and tell him to shut up and he won't be able to say anything about it and he won't remember, but when a white piece of paper is placed under his nose and wiggled twice, he will then write out a check for $25,000. It works, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>
work. The fellow would never, he would try to explain to his partners and everybody why he wrote this check and gave it over, and he said it was to a charity, but the check is gone. It's been written, it's been cashed. Nobody under the sun thinks of challenging him or calling it extortion. Why, the man himself cannot remember that it was duress. Or if he could remember that it was duress, do you know the only person who can complain? Now, this is the real shocker on PDH. This is, this is the gruesome little touch, which I saved till toward the last. The only person who can complain about PDH or assault is the person on whom it is executed. That person's husband or wife, father or mother, son or neighbor, have no power in the eyes of the police to complain. They can have this person sent to an asylum if he goes crazy, but an irregular behavior, sudden and irregular behavior on the part of one human being can be complained about officially, actually only by that person. Now, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? This person who drove into the garage, and he doesn't know why his keys are still there and why his battered hat is in the back end of it. He doesn't remember walking into the house. He woke up, he's feeling terrible. He has some odd impulses. He doesn't quite know what they are. He can't quite explain them. There's something talking to him from someplace, but he doesn't know where it's talking to him from. He has an impulse. An impulse he feels he absolutely must fight. Well, if he fights it, he'll succumb to it. You know the only person that could complain about that would be himself? If his wife had driven up and had seen the tail end of this PDH, And if she had tucked him into bed, and if the next morning he hadn't been able to remember what had happened and could not tell her the names of the assailants or tell her that he had been assaulted at all, she would not be able to complain to the police. She could issue no warrant. She could write out or swear to no complaint of any kind. The only person that could do this is the person to whom it is done. And he is under duress to forget and not to act against the people who touched him. Now, I'd say this was awfully backward, sort of an upset procedure, but it makes PDH one of the more perfect weapons. One of the more perfect weapons, and one which is very often used. You have a business partner. He has the right to come in and take some money out of the safe. He walks in the office, he walks over to the safe, he suddenly takes a large amount of money out of the safe and he walks out of the office again. He comes in the next day and uh, he makes a mysterious phone call. It's totally unlike him. He always shared his secrets with you. What do you do with the money? He takes some more money out of the safe and goes in some other direction. You take him down, buy him a cup of coffee and you say, come on, Joe, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong, he says. Strange conduct on his part. He really can't account for it. He's doing odd things. You have no right of complaint. You could send him over to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist could tell you, yes, he's been working too hard. The psychiatrist has no means or depth or knowledge of how to combat PDH. He just ignores it. Perfect weapon. The psychiatrist can't detect it. The only person to complain is your partner. You can't complain. If he's not so insane that he's going <laughs> or whatever you have to go to get into an asylum, why he's perfectly sane. After all, psychiatrists associate mostly with psychiatrists. They know what sane people are. Duh. <laughs> A psychiatrist is not going to act. The police are not going to act. Nobody's going to act. And the first thing a fellow has happened to him when he walks into a police station and says a couple of thugs grabbed me, they drugged me, they hit me around, and they told me to do certain things. The first thing that happens to you, they're going to say, all right, now, what was the, what was the number on the getaway car? You say, well, I didn't see that. Well, what were their names? And they're going to say, well, I didn't see that. But these people, they came in and they beat me and they're getting me and they're going to do this and that to me. And the cops finally turn around, you know, the death sergeant turns around and they're like, 
He thinks he's been drugged. Wife goes in. She says, you know, I'm waking up every morning with a pounding headache. I haven't had anything like this happen before. And yesterday, yesterday, I detected a strange flavor in my coffee cup. And I think at night when I go to sleep, I think I'm drugged and I'm being talked at and things are happening I don't know about. And the police say, well, a fellow for you to go see is a psychiatrist, miss. <laughs> you know, goes over to the psychiatrist and says, I don't know, but my, I think my uh, husband is doing, and I, I'm pretty sure of it because I feel terrible. The psychiatrist says, <coughs> Yeah, incipient paranoia of the tibia. <laughs> Believes people are trying to poison her. <laughs> Calls up her husband and says, I think you better institutionalize this woman. So he does. No, I'm afraid you don't complain about PDH in this society. You don't say people are doing these things. You don't say there is unnatural and unreasonable duress. Because you're crazy if you do. Well, I've never seen this as a symptom of insanity myself. Isn't that an oddity? I've been fooling around crazy people quite a while now. I don't have much interest in the subject because it seems to me that if we made every crazy person on earth completely sane, we would then have achieved 15 million more people. And we would still have two billion whose ability had not been raised. I think it would be much more important to increase the individual ability of the remaining two billion than to increase the small number of insane. I mean, make them sane. So what? So they're insane. I mean, that's their happy day. Well, that's the attitude we take on the thing. But that's only an attitude as a sort of a stopgap. It's an efficient sort of an attitude. It's an attitude that doesn't upset us. Be factual with you. Because we'd be just as happy as could be if something could be done about this problem. The terrible fact is that auditing by Scientology and Dianetics is not the answer to this problem. It is a highly effective and efficient thing to do when somebody acts very peculiar or when you feel very peculiar and all of a sudden you didn't love Mamie yesterday but you love her today. And you remember getting kind of drunk last night. And you know about Scientology, you better think in terms of an auditor. You know, some sudden change of thought that you can't account for. You know, you were all right yesterday, but today, and nothing has happened in between, brrr, except what happened between 10 and midnight last night. Well, I don't know. You better go see an auditor. The unfortunate part about it is there aren't enough auditors in the United States to go and see to everybody who's had an operation. The efficient thing to do is after delivery is affected on your wife would be at once to get a hold of an auditor and get her a good solid session and get over with. She stopped hemorrhaging, she squared to, any yap, yap, yap on the part of some dumb medico and nurse or so on, go by the boards, she wouldn't have a hangover from this. This would be a real good thing, but there aren't that many auditors. And we're trying to train 5,000 in the next two years, but that's still not enough. No, we have a better method than that. And it has to do with stopping communication. And believe me, any time you can dream up a new way of stopping communication in this society, the police and the legislatures and the government will buy it. <laughs> so the way to go about it is simply to make it absolutely and incontrovertibly and 100% against the law and make you guilty of mopery and dopery for uttering one single word around an unconscious or injured person. Put that into effect, and it'd be a different world. And we could have time to well train the large number of auditors who are needed in this world. If we could just do that, some way, somehow. 
Make them shut up while people are hurt or unconscious. If this could be done, fine. We're in a much better position today to do something about this. You yourself, being close to, or who have Scientology, auditors available, and so on, are in a rather favorable position today. Actually, it doesn't take any time if you're even vaguely in good, stable condition. I don't mean exterior, but if you're just, you know, you know, average homo sapiens, moting, you know. <laughs> uh, if you're in good condition like that, so you go have a dental operation, and the dentist says, uh, you know, it's a funny thing, dig, dig, dig. I was working on a patient whose teeth were all rotted out. <laughs> It really doesn't take very long for an auditor using modern processes to knock that little incident. Boom! As a matter of fact, it's uh, such a brief period of time today that you'd be quite startled that these things, as rough as they are when they happen, could vanish that fast. And possibly with the processes in the hands of the average auditor, it would take quite a little while to run one of these things out, maybe an hour or so two hours, the case was in poor condition if you had a dozen such incidents before you went to see an auditor. So PDH is of no great concern to a person who knows about Scientology or dying. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to dodge around about. You start acting erratically in some fashion, and you say, you know, I have just developed a tremendous love of Russia. For some reason or other, I keep thinking I ought to write out my whole checking account and send it to the Toronto Communist Party headquarters. Uh, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Where was I last night at eight? I better go see an auditor. Yeah, that's the immediate result that you should have. That's what you should think. You would know that something could happen to the mind to make you start thinking in some batty, peculiar fashion. Something that could be completely hidden from your awareness, and you would know also that there was something that could be done about it. And do you know that the human race is not in possession of these two data? That's mainly why PDH is effective. It is so little known, it is classified as an insanity. See, I mean, anybody is crazy that thinks anything has happened to him. If anything has had a bad effect on him, why, he's goofy to think it had, you know? And the human race doesn't know yet that something can be done about these things. Well, it was an interesting thing. In 1938, Amtorg had the first material on this subject, had them well, and have done so poorly ever since. <laughs> that tells you one thing. You use this stuff for evil, you don't get any place. Look at Russia. Joe Stalin had right down in his secret police headquarters a full copy of all it would have taken to make him stroke proof. But it was down in his secret police headquarters, dedicated to any use, well, just bettering brainwashing, if anything. That's all it would have done down there. Sitting down in his files was the remedy for what he died of. And some people say it was a stroke. And that is the way people who will use this material as PDH always treat it. They go by the boards with their own weapons. They use this against man, and it recoils. It recoils with a violence which is very poetic. <laughs> I've treated too many hypnotists. You know, they come in, their eyes are going, you've got to do something for me, Hubbard. <laughs> why? Well, I don't know why. I hypnotized a lot of people and did them a lot of good. And then something happened to me. You say, will somebody hypnotize you? Yeah, somebody hypnotized. The patient they were hypnotizing hypnotized them on a back bounce, you know? Over it act, over it act, over it act, and the hypnotist is hypnotized. 
a gangster could go out and bang around somebody and PDH him and PDH him and all of a sudden one day would wake up in the morning and look around at his pals and he'd say, you sure you guys weren't working on me last night? Why do I have this strange and goofy impulse to give you my share of the swag? Hmm. I must be going mad. Nothing happened to him. He just beat up one too many guys without getting beat up himself. The biter gets bit with this stuff. It's its own self-protective device. You need no vast police force in the world to go around making sure that everybody, that nobody PDH is anybody else. But we could sure use some cooperation on the part of the dentist, the doctor, and particularly the first policeman at the scene of the accident. You know, he charges him. And the people are lying there, you know. And he says, you're under arrest to see whose car is this. Uh, where is the driver? What is your name? Uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, it looks pretty bad. I guess there's nothing can be done about it. Well, you just stay there until we, you know, here you go. Yep, 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 unconscious people. And then we wonder why these accident victims go into such shock and why they don't come out of it. It's all contained in that cop visitation. All right. So if we could just get the dentist and the medical doctor and the cop to shut their traps around unconscious people, we probably would have cut insanity in the society about 50%. It's as drastic as that and as interesting as that. And it looks like it's totally feasible because it is a stop communication, as I've said before. Government will always buy that. <laughs> Therefore, it looks like a very successful program. So I invite your cooperation and preventing gray diabetics. It's the one done unintentionally by the pretty well-intentioned doctor and dentist and cop. And if we went on a little campaign of preventing gray diabetics, we would make an enormous inroad on tomorrow's insanity. And it's the biggest inroad we could make at one blow. Thank you. <laughs>